today we'll talk about bioterrorism the topic for today's lecture was gram positive rods and i think the best example that we may have for bioterrorism is a gram positive rod in terms of anthrax and the causative agent is bacillus anthracis and one of the most important thing that we want to know in bioterrorism is that there are bioterrorist agents there are out there and we have to create not only public awareness but also awareness among healthcare team that they pretty much know what their uh, response should be if God forbid something of that nature happens and you can see from these uh, posters that the number one threat in terms of bioterrorism is anthrax whereas we do have smallpox and we have here Xena pestis and some other viruses uh, also there so let's see uh, what is the definition of bioterrorism is so the most important thing in bioterrorism is that it is a deliberate release so it's not a natural release that uh, occurs naturally because of a epidemic or because of some other cause like we normally see usually in winter months there are a lot of uh, flu vax flu viruses around and people may get higher incidences of flu in a particular area but this time when we talk of bioterrorism we basically are talking about a deliberate release by a person by a group of people by anybody so that's a deliberate release of a particular microorganism or microbiological agent like a virus and bacteria or as a matter of fact any other germs or part of the germs in terms of toxins in terms of any other thing that may cause either illness called morbidity or death called uh, fatality and this may affect people it may affect animals or it may affect plants so this is the definition of uh, bioterrorism and at, at all times CDC and even NIH and the government agencies want all the health related uh, caregivers to be familiar with that and be prepared so part of the training is uh, usually called preparedness for such a calamity that may fall befall a community or a city or a country now what are these biological agents that are normally used number one thing you have to understand is that uh, most of these agents that are used for creating such a threat are already are typically found in nature and it's uh, possible that uh, they could be manipulated they could be change to increase their ability to cause a disease and the problem we have in terms of dealing with these kind of threats is that they are becoming more and more resistant to current medicines and then once it's, these are released in public in a civil society their chances are that they can spread very rapidly in the environment the other important thing is that uh, they can be released in the air or they can be used in water supply or food supply chain so anything that can come across to the people uh, can affect the outcome of how a bioterrorism threat is dealt with now uh, one of the important questions usually asked is that uh, why would people want to use that biological agent the reason is that uh, if somebody was to uh, secretly go in a in a in a city or in a place where they want to implant or they want to plant a threat over there and then be and disappear from the scene so to speak a crime scene so there's an ample time for them it's not like a conventional bomb or something like that that will explode in instantaneously so you basically can go and release that it's going to take some time hours and days for a person to not get noticed and then again disappear from the scene so this is important in terms of 
the uh, use of traditionally biological agents, especially uh, anthrax. But you also have to keep in mind that uh, some, like smallpox, for example, virus, it can be sp spread from person to person, whereas anthrax that we had this scared in 2001 cannot be spread from person to person. So let me give you a little bit of historical background so that you have a better understanding that this type of bioterrorism is, so to speak, nothing new. It's been there ages. And if you look at the timeline events, you will see as early as 1155 when the uh, Roman emperor of that time used the bodies of dead enemy soldiers that were decaying to contaminate the animal well so that water is not uh, used or if it is used it's going to become infected and then again over years uh, different nations and different kings have been using that uh, in different forms where they've been catapulting dead bodies or infected bodies into into enemies castles or uh, piling up uh, the excrements of you know all this organic waste from these dead people so that it caused problems and a, if you look at the history you'll also see that this wasn't purely for one particular area like Europe or Asia or any other part but in fact American history, especially American Civil War from 1860 to 1863, uh, we do see in the memoir of uh, W.T. Sherman that described that Confederates uh, were poisoning the ponds uh, by tossing car carcasses of dead animals in them. And then uh, even to such an extent that they had one of the physicians that attempted to use even smallpox against the Union trade. So you can see that uh, there have been this kind of a crude, we call crude uh, use of biological agents over time in many different parts of the world. And uh, this kind of uh, activity in terms of, uh, so to speak, non-conventional way of uh, utilizing a source that can affect uh, people and it can jeopardize the life of even a civil society but this has been demonstrated and you can read the historical events all over the world even you can see in some parts of the world for example in this particular slide that you're looking at right now is that there have been different cults different small organizations sometimes a single person or a group of people where they wanted to for example contaminate restaurant salad bars with salmonella and typhimurium or use for example let's say Ebola virus that's pretty dangerous though or use any other toxins like Bartolinum toxin or Q fever or Ebola in Japan and many different parts of the world but the recent uh, memory that most of us have is the uh, anthrax contaminated letters they were basically uh, sent to the people and also keep in mind that this uh, especially bacillus uh, bacillus anthrax has the capability of forming spores so they can exist in the form of powder and people are going to open that powder they're going to touch it and they will inhale it so there are chances for cutaneous as well as a respiratory anthrax and those of you who, who did follow uh, especially this anthrax containing letters they pretty much found out that they can go and, and find out the strain and trace back the strain to a particular lab or a research lab where there are a set of people that basically have an authority to use it and then uh, can be traced back in terms of where the origin of that particular virus or particular bacteria or any other microorganisms can be traced to. Uh, this slide will tell you again uh, Historically, that uh, in July of 1763, you see that there was a plan that they tried to inoculate the Indians by means of blankets. So basically, they wanted to put that infective agent to the blankets and pass this blanket on to, to poor Indians. So they 
kind of think that they, you're helping them, but in disguise you want to to kill them. And then again, uh, this part of uh, weaponizing or weapons of mass destructions that you've been hearing for a long time has been a story uh, even in U.S. military history as well that uh, war games were being played in Pacific where uh, they would uh, involve some of uh, like uh, caged animals and then release the lethal, lethal agents and then again see what the effects are but they didn't realize that uh, basically in the Cold War between uh, U.S. and Soviet Union things have been uh, kind of pretty creepy and they were kind of both of them were accumulating tons of uh, information and tons of biological weapon for use till 1942 when the uh, officially US began an offensive to basically stop that and then at that time when they decided to stop that especially for anthrax and bacillus anthracis uh, they had already produced spores of at least 5,000 bombs filled with that. So that's the like historical perspective that you can see for yourself. And then you will also see that there's a chart over here that basically keeps in mind that uh, not only are we interested in terms of what the biological agent is, but we want also to find out uh, what is the ideology between that particular person or particular group of person or cult and what is the target and how what kind of agents uh, they have they used and what's the outcome for that so the, the idea is that uh, we want to be prepared for something that we call proactive preparation so we pretty much would know if such and such, such thing happens what is it that we need to do and we can then plan accordingly and then going to read out the stories over here of the recent events and then it's in a nice table over here for your individual reading it will give you a historical perspective of things that may have happened in this country or in the world another question people usually ask is that why is it that this biological agent or bioterrorism becomes so attractive to people who want to pursue that course well, there are many answers for that. Number one is that they are very easily acquired. So all you need to do basically is, you know, with this internet wall, you can just get hold of that uh, microorganism and you just need like a couple of mills. If you remember, traditionally, one of the officers uh, of, this, of, of, of State Department presented in, uh, in the... Uh, to the rest of the world in the, the United Nations that this is enough to eliminate the whole country so that's true so you just need a couple of milliliters of a couple of you know uh, bacteria to cause such a havoc in the world and if you compare that in terms of the cost that you may get for preparing for example a conventional weapon or a nuclear weapon in terms of millions and trillions you just need one dollar in terms of expenditure as far as their lethality is concerned, again, you will see that they can cause more damage than what a conventional uh, weapon would do. So that always brings uh, caution, that brings uh, preparedness, that brings inf information for us to know. So other than uh, infectivity is important as well because they are very infective. And they are stable, we do not notice it. You can do it in a clandestine way, secret way, in implant, and then you know, even you can use a, a remote or a, a delayed kind of uh, way in terms of utilizing that biological agent. If you want to put it in water, or put it in the food, so it will take some time, some days, some weeks before you will see the effect. So, uh <clears throat> The next question we have to ask ourselves is that uh, how would we know? Because we don't want to panic. Because that's another important thing in terms of dealing bioterrorism is that you should not panic and you should not blow things out of proportion because panic will cause more harm than the actual uh, bioterrorism agent. 
So some of the points are important. For example, if you do see that multiple people are ill at the same time, that's what the definition of epidemic is. And then uh, people who were previously pretty much healthy, all of a sudden they become affected. And people become sick, people start dying. And then again, uh, they would obviously do a uh, test on them and find out if they can relate the same organism to all the people. So you have to uh, be careful. And then again, at the many a times, sometimes there are claims by those terrorists or other uh, parties to to brag about what they have done or they plan to do. And then again, you will also see uh, some of the animals dying in the zoo or some of the other uh, untoward events that may happen may suggest to you. But again, there is a word of caution. So you have to make sure that... Uh, you do your homework before you declare such an emergency. And um, normally what a good response will be in terms, especially if it is a respiratory disease, as we saw in swine flu and bird flu, and uh, many things that you recently saw. And then you see an epidemic, you see a lot of different uh, kind of scenario in terms of symptoms. And then again, uh, you see a pretty much a seasonal difference that for example flu will come in uh, winter and all of a sudden you see that happening in summer and then also uh, we need to do uh, de determine the genetics of that particular uh, microorganism that's been used and want to make sure that we establish the cause of death for those people who may have that problem now what CDC has done is that they basically have categorized quite a few microorganisms and there's a list of that you can look at CDC website they have given almost alphabetically a list from A to Z so this they keep on changing that but the most important thing that I want to uh, talk about today is category A agents because these are the ones that are easily spread they can be transmitted from person to person and they have this potential to cause a major public health impact. So uh, people can panic, public can panic, social life can disrupt and then create a very big problem, especially for the public health uh, preparedness. I want you to remember six important category A agents, of course, anthrax is on the top, smallpox, Botulinum toxin, bubonic plague, viral hemorrhagic fever, and tularemia. Now, interestingly, uh, Bacillus anthracis that causes anthrax remains at the top, and then rest of them are mostly viruses or toxins. If you look at category B, that is a little bit moderate as compared to A, but we do have a list of uh, category B agents, and you will see. Uh, Brucellosis there, epsilon toxin of Clostridium perfringens there, Salmonella there, glanders, milidosis, cytokosis, Q fever, ricin toxin, Staphylococcus, cockle enterotoxin B, typhus, viral encephalitis, and then there are some other threats that may happen, especially contaminating water supply, like Vibrio cholera and Cryptosporidium, Sporidium tarum. And this keeps keeps on changing depending upon uh, which state, which country are you talking about. But these could be the possible stress, the threats. And then again, uh, category C are has a uh, little bit lower than that, and they can be. They usually in include some of the emerging pathogens that are coming up, but not been categorized into A and B. But nevertheless, uh, let's have a little bit of detail of. Uh, the agents that I mentioned earlier about the six important category A uh, biological agents. So Bacillus anthracis, the causative uh, microorganism for anthrax. This is a encapsulated aerobic gram positive rod. And again, you can see that it has the capability of spore forming. It's going to become vegetative. It will be difficult to treat. That's why they make a powder of. It can spread in the environment and cause problem. And when, especially for humans, it's usually 
happens to uh, animals, but humans get infected most commonly. They have skin or cutaneous infections. And very rarely, they may have respiratory, gastrointestinal, or oropharyngeal form. But we do see mostly skin involved. And then that type of involvement comes from direct contact with the spores. And it's, as I said, they are in the nature, especially if you come across infected animals or any animal products and if you happen to work with animals so you may have an exposure as an occupation occupational exposure and then you can uh, inhale these aerosolized spores you can eat raw meat and get into your system but one thing you have to keep in mind is there is no person to person transmission of inhalation or gastrointestinal anthrax the other important thing for this particular bacteria, Bacillus anthracis, is that if you do see a case, you have to report it. So you not only have to report a confirmed case, but also report a suspected case immediately to your local or state department, so that's a law. Now, in a typical uh, life cycle of a anthrax spore, you can see from here, these are the anthrax spore. And then they are there out in periphery, in open. So if they come in contact with animals, cows and sheep, people can either touch them, come across them, use their meat, use their milk and other products. Or if somebody comes closer to these animals at the spores, he or she can uh, touch, have cutaneous, inhale, ingest. And the third important thing is a vector which we call it biting fly. So basically, it can take uh, the vegetative form or the spore form from the human to the animal or from the animal to the human. So it acts like a vector, a go-between. And then again, you can see a typical respiratory infection over here. Now, I hope that you don't see that ever in your life. But uh, these are some of the pictures uh, by Dr. Chotani. And they've been there just for... Uh, public awareness as well for us to to understand the impact of especially anthrax and why people are scared and they do have a good reason to be so. So you can see from here a cutaneous involvement, a typical ulcer. It can uh, be very close to eye, can involve the eye in very extreme form of, if I was to look at it, I would have thought that they are cancerous, maybe a basal cell carcinoma or a melanoma or squamous cell carcinoma, look at the crater, look at the edges of the uh, ulcer, but they basically are the lesions of anthrax. The other important thing is that anthrax develops quickly. Cancers may take a little bit of time. So what you see is that a small vesicle erupts like a small kind of a swelling that has a liquid there and then you can see day four, day six, and day by the day seven, it is really malignant. It is really dangerous. So it is uh, a challenge for us to treat. And these slides basically are copyrighted by, as I said, Dr. Chotani, and uh, properly referred in these slides. Another uh, lesion you can see of cutaneous. So you'll see day seven vesiculation, and then gradually moving to ulceration of the initial macular or papular anthrax skin lesion. And then in the right hand side, you can see a tipper, typically a scar. So that happens 15 days of illness. And that pretty much unfortunately uh, shows the typical of the last stage of the lesion. And then again, it may be uh, detrimental or fatal for the patient. Uh, New England Journal of Medicine 1999 and you can see uh, some other forms of very extreme infections of anthrax, hands and face and different parts of the world, not necessarily this part but Africa or other parts of the world. This slide shows you uh, a healed scar after treatment, so that's a good story that if you are treated in time, you are put on antibiotics on time, and you are treated well, the chances are that uh, it may have, you may have a survival rate. Uh, this picture shows you the edema, and then also shows you the lesions. 
and as a word of caution is that whenever you see any skin lesion don't underestimate it and don't uh, delay seeking an opinion because skin lesions are look very simple but they are not that simple you need to have an expert opinion on that and we have a special branch of medicine dermatology and uh, to a naked eye everything looks the same but this is not the same and as a word of caution I would also advise you not to ask and seek people uh, take uh, over-the-counter lotions and creams and so on and so forth because sometimes the uh, lesions are such that if you don't initiate the therapy in time uh, it will be uh, not good for the patient or it may delay the treatment so always play a word of caution and also keep in mind that some of the uh, skin lesions may be the early signs of a systemic disease and there may be something else going on so that's a word of caution and i would do that unless you're really trained for do that because as we say that eyes don't see what mind doesn't know if you don't know what what is it you will never see that but it's there and we do see show you some of the pictures because part of the training is that people when they look at this picture and then they recall oh i didn't know that i had that i saw such and person having that because the thing is is that there has to be a little bit of awareness among health related people at least to pick up a problem and have a good opinion or refer people to the proper authorities gastrointestinal anthrax we can see uh, lesions there you can see uh, you know tissue damage there and then of course it was done on colonoscopy or endoscopy francisella tularensis and another uh, category a microorganism causing a disease called tularemia it is also potentially serious and it does occur in the united states and it is caused by a bacteria francisella tularensis and this is found in animals especially rodents rabbits and hares people who get tularemia uh, they will have a sudden uh, fever chills headaches diarrhea muscle aches and then over time they will have we call it progressive weakness once the muscle more and more muscle gets involved and in the end people may have pneumonia they develop chest pain bloody sputum and then difficulty in breathing and sometimes the, uh, the breathing may totally stop and that will be fatal typical history is that if you ask these fish people and investigate there is a history of being bitten by an infected tick deer fly or any other insect or they have been handling infected animal carcasses or they have been eating or drinking contaminated food food that's been contaminated with francisella tularensis so the important thing you need to know is that tularemia is not known to be spread from person to person uh, people who have tularemia do not need to be isolated and people who have been exposed to tularemia bacteria should be treated asap because as i said earlier it could be fatal if it's not treated in time and this is a typical picture of this woman having a swelling of tularemia it looks like an abscess but if you were to do a biopsy and you look at the microorganism you will see a uh, typical bacteria the third important category a bioterrorism threat is Yersinia pestis the causative agent of plague and again it is uh, found uh, in rodents and fleas in many areas and uh, why are we concerned about that because there's a pneumonic, pneumon uh, pneumonic plague as a bioweapon and just a couple of days before it actually goes out of the hand the causative agent is Yersinia pestis and uh, as I said earlier many a time these kind of bacteria do, is it, do exist in the environment but for now we believe that pretty much is taken care of you wouldn't uh, rarely see inguinal bubo we call bubonic plague and there's a typical uh, historical book textbook picture for that and there's a flea there and you can see that it is teeming with that uh, plague bacteria clostridium botulinum again is an important thing and uh, we will discuss that again in detail as a part of clostridium and there are different kinds of there are actually uh, different types of clostridium one of the 
clostridium that causes botulinum is the one that causes muscle paralysis disease. There's a toxin release uh, by that particular bacteria that will cause a respiratory arrest and that will cause a big problem. And you can also see it's very bad in terms of causing uh, lethality and problem, morbidity, but a good use can be made because Botox, for example, is used uh, to basically uh, treat people uh, for anti-aging. And if you look at the details again, uh, you'll also see that it's very common in foodborne. If you want to go for especially honey, you have to make sure that there is no such contamination by Clostridium botulinum. And then uh, some of the other diseases are there, not that important, but they are infectious to animals, especially brucella. And this brucella is uh, primarily passed among the animal and they cause diseases. And you wonder why are we talking about that? Because we come in contact with these animals, we eat their meat or drink their milk, and sometimes we have them as pet. But humans can become uh, infected when they come in contact with them or they consume their products. So we, we have a disease called brucellosis and uh, uh, it's not very common here, but you can see with 100 to 200 cases every year, but it is, it is there and we need to know that. And this is an animal disease. As you can see, some parts of the country have a higher incidence, California, Texas, Florida, shown in red, very high incidence. And then again, warm climate will assist that in terms of uh, this bacteria being prevalent and causing more prob problems uh, in the farmland. Smallpox, uh, to our knowledge, we think is, is a pox virus. It's been eliminated from the world because of the vaccination. It is also called variola major. Uh, and uh, this is the most common form of smallpox. It usually comes with a very extensive rash and a very high fever. And then we can see that pretty much it, it kind of takes over the person's whole skin. And if you were to uh, look at historically, this very Ola major fatality was about like 30%. And it starts with a very small lesion and then expands for the whole body. And sometimes the outbreaks also occur. We had the last case, especially in US in 1949. But in the world, we had that in 1977. I, and I hope that... Uh, you don't see that in your life, but this is how it looks like. All bodies involved and everything is there. And then you can see that happening. And then uh, some of the patients arrive and you will see a typical facial thing that is there in terms of the lesions that they have. This is uh, part two of bioterrorism uh, lecture. So we were talking about some of the bacteria and viruses. The other important agent is viral hemorrhagic fever. And again, uh, this basically refers to quite a few viruses and they cause a group of uh, illnesses and uh, we kind of lump them together as viral hemorrhagic fever. And they involve multi-system, that's what they call it. They, we call them a multi-system affecting viruses and the whole body is involved. And again, respiratory system, GI system, pretty much as something systemic that goes to blood. And uh, what normally happens is that the uh, vascular system is basically damaged. And then again, the body's ability to regulate itself is impaired. Symptoms are often accompanied by bleeding. So there's a lot of hemorrhage there. And that bleeding is itself uh, rarely life-threatening. But what normally happens is that some types of hemorrhagic fever, what is it can cause mild illnesses, whereas many of these viruses uh, can possibly cause a severe and life-threatening uh, disease. It depends upon the uh, virulence of that particular group of
And this type is the injury that you see the skin lesion, hemorrhage. It can also affect uh, fish. You can see a lot of hemorrhage in the fish and the lesions of this young girl over here on both sides. So these are typical hemorrhages and typical uh, lesions that you would see. So let me summarize uh, that whatever I've discussed so far. So these are some of the characteristics of a typical uh, bioterror agents and you can see that we have a an agent on the left like anthrax, plague, tularemia, brucella, Q fever, smallpox and other viruses and botulinum toxin so we have a type for that and there is a dose that is required and then again there's a way that uh, this is spread like inhalation and what kind of symptom do they give and what is the duration of this system so this is a very good uh, table for you to pay attention to and uh, what are the anim animal reservoirs and how does our body deals with it so this is a good index and you can compare and contrast and I uh, believe quite a few questions are expected from this particular slide and then finally uh, as I said earlier, before I began the lecture, that what's your role as a pharmacist? I'm going to ask you as well. Well, the most important role that you may have is that uh, don't panic. So you have to minimize hysteria because many times things are blown out of the proportion. You have to recognize the pattern or outbreak. You have to be very cautious. You have to be prepared for anything, even unexpected. And you have to make sure that the antidotes or supportive therapies are given in unusual, not given, uh, maybe given in usual doses allowed. So what we call is pharmacovigilant. You have to be pharmacovigilant. And you also have to coordinate with the public health officials. You need to uh, try to avoid holding. And then again, uh, keep on checking uh, CDC website because as I said earlier, they keep on updating the categories from A to B and C. And sometimes some new threats may come up. So we have to be familiar with that. And uh, also keep in mind that there's a national pharmaceutical stockpile. So if we need some drugs that are particularly effective on there, they are maintained by C CDC. And then again, we need to coordinate with metropolitan areas. And then again, uh, there is uh, lots of supplies that we have, fortunately. Uh, so you can see from here, there are 12 separate 50 ton kind of push packages that can be supplied within 12 hours to treat anthrax, to treat smallpox, to treat plague, to treat tularemia, to go after botulinum toxin and even treat viral hemorrhagic fever. So we have to be prepared for that. And then again, also keep in mind that you also working in a pharmacy, follow a vendor managed inventory material. And then finally, are we really prepared for something that's coming in the future? You never know. So you have to read the news and want to make sure that everything is there because CDC recently is talking about a, some of the new targets. That's why they included E. coli, Salmonella, Staph and Shigella. That is going to be the next target for bioterrorism is your food. And this is the whole plan and kit that you, wanna, you may want to read and study and find out what is it that is required in terms of us using it.